Hey everybody, just as a reminder, I'm a narrator on Chilling, the awesome horror app that features over 1,000 horror stories, over a dozen narrators, some of who you might know from YouTube, as well as full-length novels and exclusive series, and Chilling Originals. You can select and change the ambient sound on the background of these stories whenever you want without affecting the story that you're listening to, and we release hours of new stories every week. Click the link in the description to download and start your free trial to see if you like it. Have you ever worked somewhere so long that the days have kind of blended together and you forget when it started and when it ends? That's the feeling I got when I began work at this call center downtown. The place is constantly busy, and that really isn't the problem. But my mind tends to wander and I sometimes can't shake the feeling that what I'm doing here doesn't really matter. I've even voiced these concerns to my boss who has insisted that big changes coming will reinvigorate the workforce but I'm not so sure. What we are doing here doesn't seem to matter. A day is just a day and I've often lost track of weeks at a time. It got so bad that last week I asked if I could be placed on a different shaft. And maybe that would switch things up a bit. Graveyard was the only one available, so I figured, why not? Let's see where it takes me. The first few nights were pretty routine. Boring, and they started to make me regret ever signing up for the change. But then something extraordinary had happened. I was wandering the halls up near the fourth floor, trying to find the restroom because the ones on the floor that I work on were being remodeled and I noticed a door that I had never seen before. The way this building is set up, you see, the offices that we work at normally face west and we can see a little bit of the mountains that dip over the horizon. It's really a pretty scenic view, almost enough to make you think that what you're doing here stuck in a cubicle all day actually means something. Anyway, the point is that this side of the building is mostly large panel windows, that show off the epic desert area and the valleys beyond. We are kind of out here in the middle of nowhere and it's both lonely and solemn, I guess. And there definitely shouldn't have been a door there in the middle of the hallway, leading to seemingly out of the building into thin air. I think I was sure that I was hallucinating, but still, I felt the need to investigate. I walked over to it and reached for the handle but stopped short. A weird sensation in the back of my brain told me that this was a bad idea. I looked around. The hallways were deserted except for me. I somehow convinced myself to push that feeling aside and open the door. I was expecting to see a long drop to the mountains below, but instead I found myself staring at a bland hallway, the same as the one that I was standing in. Another corridor but that didn't seem possible. For some reason, I chose to take a step inside the newfound hallway. Immediately, the fluorescent lights illuminated the long hallway to reveal further corridors, branching off into unknown spaces, and I found myself wanting to explore. As I got midway down the hall, though, that odd sensation of danger was tingling down my spine again, and I turned to leave only to find that the door that I was in didn't exist anymore. I was now completely inside this strange, abstract space. The door that I had just stepped out of was no longer there, just another long corridor that seemed to stretch on infinitely. The walls and the carpet were all the same, so bland and meaningless that it was difficult to determine which way I was meant to go. I was beginning to realize that coming here was a mistake and... I began to wonder if I was dreaming. Sadly though, no matter what method I used, I couldn't wake up. I decided to try to trace the hallways and determine where they went. Using the small lead pencil from my own pocket, I drew a line down the side of the wall. I figured it might be the only way that I could hope to find a way back to where I had come from. For a long time, I kept tracing the wall to my right, figuring that it would take me somewhere different. I never once encountered the line that I drew in front of me. 
I could tell that I was making progress, or at least it felt that way. I stopped after about 10 minutes and began to second guess myself, turning around and following the line back the way that I had come. It took less than 5 minutes to reach the beginning, but I had been wandering and drawing for nearly half an hour. How was that even possible? I started to run down the corridor, turning left and right and hoping that the maze would finally reach a climax. Then, just when I was beginning to lose hope of ever getting out, I saw a door again and I rushed toward it and flung it open. The familiar setting of the office I was accustomed to returned and I ran out. When I looked back, the door was gone and the eerie experience was over, but it lingered with me that night, even preventing me from sleeping haunting my brain and making my body shake. I took so many sleep aids as I could without overdosing and I finally fell unconscious. I told myself it was simply an awful fever dream or something beyond my understanding, and I reassured myself that it would never happen again. But little did I know that it would change everything about me and everyone that had worked there. The following time that I was at work, I was trying to take calls and forget all about the weird experience that I had had on the fourth floor when this strange noise came over my headset. At first, I thought it was a glitch in the software like feedback, but then I heard a voice amid the sound. Michael Long, come to the fourth floor, room 302, immediately. It was a strange message, but it was so precise that I knew it was a mistake. Somebody was summoning me, and because I'm both an idiot and so dang curious, I did as instructed and went up to the room. The entire floor was deserted again and part of me wanted to search for that door, but I kept on task and found the room with no issues. There were two smartly dressed people inside, a man and a woman, and they were standing on the opposite side of a long conference table. I didn't recognize either of them, but then again... This is a big place, so I doubted that I would have. Something about their demeanor told me that they didn't work for the call center. They were like government or military. The woman confirmed this. Michael Long, please take a seat. My name is Emma Carter, and I work for a think tank called Icarus. She sat, offering me a drink. I did as I was told and realized why that eerie feeling was still in the air, as I said. You work for that other place that I went to, huh? I immediately recognized the mythical connections. Icarus, that's about an endless maze of some kind, and the legendary Icarus somehow was involved. My Greek literature is foggy from college, but the name is catchy for sure. Icarus' father built the labyrinth for his sole purpose, to keep a monster at bay, but we made ours for another reason. We want to analyze the endless possibilities of virtual reality, the man said. Wait, so that door I went in yesterday was like a simulation. Carter gave me a tense smile. More like an evaluation. The mere fact that you were able to see the door and then also move freely through the corridors is, is a major breakthrough. The man slid a small disc toward me and when I touched it, a massive hologram revealed itself. The place that you stood on is more than just a virtual reality. It was an alternate dimension. We discovered a way to harness its energy and allow for passage between dimensions, but it's been extremely unstable. In fact, often we have been unsuccessful in being able to get anyone to even find the passage at all. We began to suspect that perhaps the issue wasn't with the dimensional gate itself, but the subjects, he told me. The maze was larger than I had expected. In fact, it seemed almost endless. An impossible dream that kept circling like a Mobius strip. How is it designed? I feel like it's far too advanced for anything that we are ensuring from the center. I told them. Emma gave her co-worker a glance and he gave a curt nod, giving her permission to speak. There's something special about you and a few select other employees here at the Brighter Futures call center. We suspect that you may have certain biological markers that make it easier for you to pass through the gate. Do you recall when you were first interviewed and asked for multiple lab tests? 
she asked. I paused and frowned, the memory so vague that I hadn't even thought to register it. Are you saying that you hired me because you wanted to use me as a guinea pig? I asked as I stood up, ready to walk out. I was uncomfortable with being their stooge for this human experiment. And then I realized that was probably the case for everybody that worked here. All of us being used for this strange development. I suggest you calm down. If you walk out that door, there's a chance that the markers within you will begin to flux. Due to the fact that you have recently passed through the dimensions, you still have a connection to that place. In a sense, you are like Theseus from the legend, still trapped inside of the labyrinth. The man told me, but I wasn't really listening. I don't care if you offer me thousands of dollars or some lifetime stipend. This felt wrong. Was anything that we did here even impactful or was it all simply for this other experiment? I needed to know. How many people have you been monitoring here? I asked. Currently, only you and five others. Should we successfully be able to determine the roots of the simulation, we should be able to do more by the end of the year. Emma answered. The root? What's that supposed to mean? Are you saying you people didn't create it? Suddenly, it felt like my head was spinning. The man was still standing and extended his hand as though to grab me from falling. We want to make you an offer. To return through the door and to observe and record everything you find there. Once we determine its origins and unlock its potential... Our entire species can leap generations ahead in development and evolution, he said. You don't even know if I would make it back in one piece, I said as I opened the door and shook my head. Find another of your nameless lackeys to do your bidding. I don't want any part of it, I said as I took one step out the door. Don't forget our warning. We're offering you the chance to return home. Without our help, the next time you traverse the blank spaces, you might not return, Emma warned. I had no way of being sure if that was a threat, so instead of responding, I made good on my word and I laughed. I closed the door behind me and walked straight ahead. As I suspected when I turned around, the door had disappeared. It made me wonder if the people that I had talked to had even been real. Was I hallucinating? I decided to clock out early and get a physical exam. I needed some kind of basis in reality to establish what was happening to me. But the quick physician showed nothing and I couldn't afford any kind of scan. As far as I knew, I was still normal. So did that even explain what was happening to me? And what if the experience itself was real? What was it within that blank space that called out to me? I googled the Icarus think tank, but I didn't find anything on it. Of course, I should have anticipated that. If they did work for the government, it was doubtful that anything would be found in the project online. I tried to push it out of my mind, but as time passed, I saw that strange blank door at all different times. Even when I was away from the office, it frightened me, and I wanted to destroy it, and yet, I was drawn to it at the same time. I thought that I was crazy at first, seeing strange doors out of nowhere and also dreaming about endless corridors. Who would think that was normal? And then, almost a week after my first incident, I heard a co-worker named Lucia mention that she was having issues to one of her friends. There was this weird empty floor that I got lost in last night. It took me hours to get back here. She explained, but the friend thought it was only a story. When we were alone, I took a risk and I revealed my own connection to this phenomenon. Lucia actually seemed relieved. Thought I was going crazy, she admitted. Has anybody talked to you about the doors? I asked. What? No, nobody except you seems to know. Suddenly we had a connection that only we seemed to know about, but I was sure that there were more. I told her about how two strange people had tried to recruit me and steered her away. Her eyes got wider and wider, the more frightened with every word. This is some kind of weird conspiracy crap. So they haven't contacted you? I asked. No, but give me their names if you can. 
My father has a few old friends in the army. He might be able to figure this out. She told me and I scribbled them down and passed it to her. As she left, I felt a little relieved to think that I wasn't alone. Maybe together we could solve this puzzle. And all the while, the strange attention I felt coming to work grew and grew, but this was a coworker, a potential ally in this battle that was reaching out. I received an email a few days later from Lucia, but it warned me not to open it at the call center. The rest of that day, my heart was pounding. Her insistence to not open the email at work told me that we were being monitored at the call center. Did that mean that our supervisors were aware of what the government was doing and they had signed off on it? And we needed proof. Maybe we could sue their butts for this. I opened the email as soon as I got home, surprised to find that it was a video file of Lucia as she was walking toward the mysterious door that kept appearing for both of us. Here it goes, everyone. See you on the other side, she told the audience. And then she stepped across the barrier, but the camera went haywire. This bizarre shrieking noise resonated across my brain, and I nearly tossed my headphones across the room in response. I can't put my finger on it, but that noise was unearthly. The video eventually returned to a blank screen, and I heard heavy breathing and Lucia was on the floor. She looked like she had been attacked. And then this creature, this shadowy thing, grabbed at her ankles and dragged her across the screen. I tried to freeze the image to get a look at it, but I could only see fuzzy pixels. It didn't even look like it should exist in our world. It wasn't even a three-dimensional shape, yet it moved like a living and breathing beast. Heavy breathing filled the recording and the camera moved. My heart skipped a beat as I recognized the man from the conference room. He had been a partner with this Icarus project. If you want your coworker to live, come to room 302 tomorrow night. This video will self-destruct. Just like the old school movies, his words came true and the clip was corrupted. I sat there unsure of how to respond. I should have called the police, but I doubt they would even believe me. Instead, I called my boss and requested to be placed on graveyard shift again. I had to find out what happened to Lucia. I clocked in that evening around 8pm and scheduled my break for 10. I would only have a 30 minute lunch break to find the Icarus men in black again, and I prayed that it would be enough. Just like before, I went to the fourth floor and I started to wander. The silence was deafening. There were no mystery doors at this time, but it definitely felt like I was going in the right direction. Just when I felt that I should give up, a voice called to me and I saw the man standing in a doorway. Immediately, I rushed him, pushing him inside and against the wall. Where is she? What did you do to her? Michael, that will be enough. The woman sharply commanded, but I was tired of playing by their rules. Taking out my ballpoint pen, I placed it mere inches from the man's pupil and shouted, I'm not doing jack until I know that woman is okay. I'm fine, Michael. A voice confirmed, and before I knew how to react, the man shoved me away, breaking my arm as he did. I fumbled onto the ground and looked across the table, stunned to see that Lucia was now on the other side in the same uniform as the others. I could hardly move because of the pain and I heard them mumble something to each other. Dexter, you went overboard. We need him, I heard Carter say. Someone came into the room and injected my arm with something even more painful than my break. I laid there for a moment, the room spinning as I felt my body begin to heal. What the heck was that? I said as I realized that I could move my arm again. The particles from within the alternate universe injected into your body to hyper-aggressively stimulate your natural healing. Emma told me and then gave me a lopsided smile. The family's in the medical field. Please quit acting so dumbfounded all the time. You're creating products for medical trials now. Whatever happened to trying to be cautious and testing this out? I asked, glaring at Lucia. And what has happened to you? Did they brainwash you? The simplest way I can explain this is that I'm not the co-worker you remember, she responded. 
The man who identified himself as Dexter Ward said that the labyrinth was like a web or a hall of yarn, and at the end of each of those unraveling strings was an alternate door that led to a different universe. So this pocket dimension really is like a connecting hallway to all other realities. How is something like that even possible? I asked. Again, that is why people like you are vital to understanding this phenomenon, Emma insisted. My focus was on Lucia. Wherever you're from, were there also people there like me that could traverse the blank spaces? I asked. Quite so, Mr. Long. We found several. However, we have been unable to figure out why. Just as testing was done to you, similar tests were run on the ones that we could identify. There is nothing out of the ordinary, or rather the tests we ran weren't sufficient to produce the desired data, she told me. And you think by going back that we could find out more? I asked the group. All of them seemed in agreement with this idea, but I wasn't quite ready to budge and stick my neck out for such a risky operation. I wanted in writing that if for some reason I die or disappear or whatever, this whole thing gets shut down here. These people don't need to be involved. Take your nonsense elsewhere, I told them. You aren't exactly in a position to give a demand, Dexter reminded me. Well, this is a negotiation, right? You need me to get this data collected. So, what can you offer that I would be interested in? I countered. Dexter shifted uncomfortably and Emma smiled, surprised by my tact. She nodded and said, Fine, we don't need the call center anyway. It was just one of several vantage points that could get us back to the blank spaces. Is there anything else you need, Mr. Long? A record of any other interactions with the dimensions that you managed to keep. Like what you found on Lucia. The other Lucia, I mean. I said nodding toward the one in the room. That record was sent to us deliberately. We viewed it as the first message that we had received from the other side. Emma clarified. I paused, standing up and trying to wrap my head around what they were saying. So Dexter wasn't there, I asked. I was, but once again, you're thinking in terms of the universe that you understand and know. The iteration you saw on that screen was sending us a message. Of what, I can't say. Dexter responded. Now this makes my head hurt, I admitted. But I agreed to the terms and said that I would return first thing in the morning. They promised benefits and life insurance, triple my pay. They seemed desperate if I'm being honest and it made me feel like I had control of the situation. But that couldn't have been further from the truth. The next morning at my desk, there was a note explaining that I needed to visit the company nurse and request a specific appointment time with a Dr. West. Supposedly, he would be the one to give me another serum which would increase the likelihood of finding the blank spaces. This will also record your thoughts onto a cloud service. Everything you've experienced relating to the other dimension will be filtered here for documentation, West told me. The injection reminded me of what Icarus had already done, and it told me that once again these people were keeping some of their secrets close to their chest. It felt exhilarating though to finally cross the threshold again. I had been thinking about the blank space for so long and now to be face to face with potential answers. I actually opened the door without fear and stepped across into the virtual space. Wes told me that my very thoughts were being recorded and I guess that freaked me out a little bit, but I've tried my best to adapt and focus on the scenario in front of me. The corridors are spacious and plain but also narrow and cramped. For such an empty space, they give a vibe of claustrophobia that I've never felt before. It's been almost a day, although to be honest, I cannot tell time like I used to. There isn't day or night here, and I don't get tired or hungry. In fact, I don't think I have even needed to use the bathroom. I've been thinking about that and wondering if my body has actually undergone some metaphysical change within this dimension. The creature that I saw attack Lucia was, for example, only two dimensions. Could it be that within this space, everything exists outside of the reality that we understand? It's a complete glitch in our perception of the universe, a road that is leading nowhere. 
On the second day, I found what looked like a different type of room. This one was black and square and for some reason, I got the feeling that it was near the center of the maze. There was a code on the door that led into an inner chamber. On a whim, I typed in the word Icarus and it opened. The room was dark and the oxygen felt light and it was cold and ethereal. I followed the sound of faint footsteps. Were they my own? I wasn't even sure why this room had suddenly existed. Was the space itself taunting me and leading me into a deeper place? I soon found the answer as I rounded another corner. There were tubes of people all in stasis of some kind hanging on the wall of the corridor. Each of them had a number carved under their pod, a Roman numeral. I saw that one of them looked like Dexter, another reminded me of a younger version of Lucia. I froze and tried my best to not scream as I saw one marked with a Roman numeral for three. It looked like me except the face was unfinished. The features were still being completed by some unknown software that was constantly updating this fresh body. Was that really me? Did that new me have a soul? Was this all the product of some mad god? The end of the hallway led into a control room of some sort. Data was being compiled and calculated. Some of it didn't even seem possible. And on the screens, I saw hundreds if not thousands of creatures that resembled the strange limber monster that had attacked Lucia on camera, each of them roaming a different version of the maze. What are you doing here? A voice cracked the silence and I turned to see an older woman there, hair as white as snow, her eyes paler than the blue sky. She was holding a key in her left hand like her life depended on it. Icarus sent me, I told her truthfully. Icarus. So the first experiment was a success then, and now they've come to bargain. She said as she walked past me and placed the key into a small slot next to the monitors. All of them began to rewind the videos and the shrieking of the monster echoed loudly as I covered my ears. I was told to document the origins of this place. Are you its creator? I asked. The woman laughed. My name is Lavina Pickman. I wish I could take credit for this masterpiece, but I'm afraid not. Just another cog in the machine. But if you're telling the truth, then it's already too late. Too late to stop any of this. The woman rambled. Icarus is searching for answers, and so am I. What made people like me and Lucia special? I asked. She turned to me, a gun now in her hand as she fired one bullet straight into my stomach. I hunched over in confusion as the older woman fired another into my kneecap. I should think that would be obvious. She paused as she stepped over me and put the gun to my head. You were born here. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. A man bearing a striking resemblance to Emma Carter stood over me and took off his glasses. You're away, congratulations. The surgery was intense, but we managed to pull you through, he said. I'm sorry, where am I? I asked, looking out the window. The landscape reminded me of rural Canada. Washington State, you were dead for two hours, Mr. Long, but now you're alive again. I checked my arm and saw a tattoo of a Roman numeral there, a shudder going up and down my spine. I didn't fully understand everything, but I knew that the memories of the maze and Icarus had to be true. You know, it seemed as though I was in an entirely different body, a different long from, a different universe. I got released from the hospital the next day and it has been almost a month since then. I haven't heard from Icarus and there's no record of the life that I knew. This Michael was an architect in a small Washington town. I've told myself that I can try to live this life and make it my own, but my soul hurts. I know something beyond the veil of reality is still calling to me. I know one day in this new life a door will appear and I'll have to step across back into that place. I pray this time I'm ready for what's on the other side.